Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much indeed for making it. I'm tempted to ask who is here on the way back from the Google party, um, given how late it ended. Um, but you don't have to declare your hand at this stage. Let's get going, because you've been good enough to turn up bang on time, so it's our duty to, to start on time as well, and others will, will join us. But there are already 400 people out there watching this uh, online, and uh, my experience earlier in the week is that that will build uh, very quickly. And one of the things we would like to do is, as part of this session, which will last literally one hour, is uh, to ask you to engage if you'd like to. Uh, there is a hashtag up there, hashwef pundits, and uh, we can uh, uh, harvest your ideas from the floor, and I'll come to you at certain points if necessary. But uh, we'll try and get some of those uh, ideas into the discussion, uh, your words of qualification, your words of concern, and indeed you may disagree with everything that's being said on the platform. I have to remind you, um, Kishore was here last year, that this time last year, on this Saturday morning, Egypt was unraveling. Everyone was watching their iPad 1s at that point, uh, watching live streaming from Takriya Square. And obviously the question then was going to be what would happen? Would it happen in Libya? Might it happen in Syria? Elsewhere, no one predicted that anything of what has taken place would happen. So predictions, pundits, professors, um, how accurate can people be? It's a wild world at the moment, and I'm in the news business, and uh, none of us can really foresee what's going to happen this week, let alone next month or, or next year. But there are certain trends, and that's what I'd like to pick up. Black swans, we don't realize what we don't realize. Well, let's hope from the platform that uh, they realize the kind of things we're not realizing uh, at the moment. It's the speed of events, which I think is taking us all by surprise. It's the 10 years of history in 10 months is the way I would categorize uh, the last um, year. And I'm struck as well by even how the chiefs of defense are beginning to warn, uh, whether it be the chief of defense in the United States, General Dempsey or General Richards in Britain, that it's no longer terrorism that, that is the threat, it's social unrest and the implications of economic problems um, on security uh, in their countries, and particularly what General Dempsey has, has issued a warning about uh, for uh, Europe. So there is the hashtag. Matthias at the back is, is uh, harvesting that. Uh, let me just uh, remind you, I don't think I need to, um, who is here. We have Tom Friedman uh, from the New York Times, Kishore Mahbubani um, from the Lee Kuan Yew School uh, in, in, of Public Policy in Singapore, Gideon Rachman, um, Associate Editor, Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent, uh, a commentator of the Financial Times, Nouriel Roubini, um, Professor of Economics and International Business. You all know him. He was on our BBC debate yesterday. And Bob Schiller, uh, the Arthur Oaken Professor of Economics at, at Yale. Thanks all, uh, to all of you for, for making it as well. I'm not going to ask them to start uh, to give a five-minute summary of where they think the world is going to go. I'd like to start putting some issues to them, particularly, I think, the issue of power and leadership, which has come through in many of the consultants' reports here, many of the discussions, leadership uh, really struggling with the kind of models and realities uh, of what is unfolding at the moment, and the capacity of leadership, the abilities of leadership at the moment. Kishore, you teach people how to do good governance. Hmm. What is the capacity of leadership? Let's go through all of you on leadership, please. Well, I, you know, uh, as you know, there's too much Euro-pessimism in the world, and my goal is to balance it with Asian optimism. And the reason, I guess, to answer your question, why Asia is doing relatively well, is because of a very quiet kind of unpretentious, un, how do you say, demonstrative leadership. You know? and, and let me just illustrate with just three ways, huh, in how this leadership is making Asia a much better place. One, there'll be no major wars. In fact, the likelihood of wars in Asia is probably the lowest it's ever been, except, of course, if you include Iran and the United States, which, of course, if it happens, incidentally, would be a major geopolitical gain for China if the United States attacks Iran. Uh, but throughout most of Asia, wars are disappearing because leaders are connecting. Secondly, even though there's rising inequality in the world, the long-term trend towards less and less poverty is continuing. In fact, the, one of the few UN Millennium Development Goals that the world will meet is the halving of global poverty by 2015. The trend in 2012 will accelerate, and China and India will continue to contribute enormous numbers in terms of reducing poverty. And thirdly, of course, the, in terms of the shift of power to Asia, 
will also continue because the leaders in Asia, whatever else they may disagree on, uh, actually there's a very powerful consensus among all of them that this is our time. This is our moment to make it. Let's not lose it. And that's why yesterday, you know, I chaired two panels, one on the future American power and the other on ASEAN. And the one on ASEAN was so much better because you got from the ASEAN ministers a list of very concrete, small, incremental steps they are taking, building highways from China down to Southeast Asia, having an open skies policy, which was unthinkable three years ago in Southeast Asia, making Southeast Asia the most promising corner of the world today. So there are things happening in Asia, happening quietly under the screen because of the quiet, unpretentious nature of Asian leadership. But what about leadership? Because your country in May had an election which uh, rather shocked the uh, ruling PAP party. Um, George Yeo was on the platform in Dalian saying that this was a real shake-up moment. And that, therefore, there's something else going on, which I want to come to, which is the nature of the empowerment from bottom up. Quickly, again, you've told us what we know from you already about the shift of power to the east. But this issue of leadership and how you see the capacity of leadership, and I want to open it up to everyone, whether you're in London, Washington, South Africa, or Russia, or anywhere at the moment, this change of pressure on leadership. Well, I, 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 social media is also transforming Asia. I mean, it's, as you know, it transformed Singapore. The last elections for the first time, three ministers lost their seats in the elections. It never happened before in 30, 40 years. And that's, of course, the result of the power of the social media. But at the same time, I can also tell you that the governments are responding to it, reacting to it, listening to it. And even, even China, surprisingly, where the social media, as you know, is exploding, the leaders in China now know that they've got to pay attention to this. And therefore, as you know, in Wuhan, unusually, instead of suppressing a demonstration, they talk to the demonstrators and they diffuse it. They know they've got to change too. Right. Tom, your perspective, particularly on power, leadership, the capacity sure. of leadership at the moment. Well, you know, uh, let me just start by <clears throat> making one point, Nick, and uh, I'm a big believer in, in, in looking at the plumbing to understand what's going on. So I think you have to start by saying what, what's going on in the plumbing. And uh, those of you who have been on my other panels know it's, I believe, the biggest thing happening in the world is in the last decade, we've gone from a connected to a hyper-connected world. Um, and it's actually changing everything, um, including about leadership. And uh, I think it's changing leadership in two really fundamental ways. Um, uh, one you could see in Tahrir Square, um, where I was uh, a year ago, and, and the other um, you can see in um, two news items that uh, co coincided fairly closely together this year, um, uh, and one uh, involved Netflix and the other involved Putin. Um, uh, the Americans, the audience, are familiar with Netflix. It's the uh, Amazon.com of, of uh, a home, uh, a home videos. Uh, an incredibly fast-growing, hot company, um, uh, really, you know, uh, one of the hottest in the last couple of years. Um, Netflix CEO decided this year that um, he wanted to change their business model and um, change their pricing model, and um, uh, simply announced it one day. Uh, they lost 800,000 customers in 48 hours uh, because their customers said, "Excuse me, um, you may think you're still in a one-way conversation, but we're in a two-way conversation now." And I think that's the biggest change that leaders around the world are discovering. That the days of a one-way conversation, whether you're the Prime Minister of Singapore, um, uh, the, the head of Netflix, um, uh, or uh, in, the, in the case of Putin, the Prime Minister of Russia, because a few weeks later, uh, Putin basically said the same thing. I think that, um, gosh, I think I'd like to have another eight years here, and I think I'll be president next time. And um, the Russian people said, I excuse me, you're in a two-way conversation here now, not just a one-way conversation. So that's the first, I think, big change with leadership. Um, we are all in two-way conversations now. Second thing I would say, and this you really saw in Tahrir Square, um, I have a friend, Kurt Carlson, who runs a SRI, Stanford Research Institute, and uh, Kurt um, coined an idea which I've labeled Carlson's Law. Um, and again, the basis of it is the hyper-connected world. And the way I put it is like what, what, what Kurt says is that the, the more connected the world becomes, the more everything top-down becomes dumb and slow, and the more everything bottom-up becomes smart but chaotic, okay? 
So you really saw this in Tahrir Square. Mubarak was dumber and slower every day than the day before. The uh, crowd in Tahrir Square was smarter and more chaotic. That is, I saw more innovation in Tahrir Square in 18 days than I saw in 18 years in Egypt. And I think the challenge for both political leaders and corporate leaders is to understand um, the power of what can now be communicated and, and, and generated from below um, and, and meet it in the right place. That is, the sweet spot for innovation now, whether it is policy innovation or economic innovation, is moving down. Uh, it's no longer this top, it's actually moving down. That doesn't mean though it's moving, and some of these social movements have discovered this, it's moving all the way down. We're a leaderless movement. Well, we've discovered that a lot of these leaderless movements end up like a leaderless movement. That is that they, they really don't go anywhere. But I think that where you're going to see effective models is where leaders unleash, enable, and empower what's coming from below, meet it somewhere with a vision of their own, and generate it in another direction. But the sweet spot for innovation in policy, I think, and in politics, is moving down. Well, let's continue looking at this trend. Look at what happened in Congress with SOPA, with the massive uh, upward Perfect. pressure within seven days. The same thing happened in India with yeah. Anna Hazara. It's happening all over the place, and with Wukan as well. Again, move forward on this, Gideon. Your perspective when it comes to the, what, what is the pressure now, particularly on foreign governments, and including a government in Britain, which was under enormous pressure uh, during last August when we had riots in the centre sure. of London. Well, I think we are in a kind of fragile social moment in, in, in Europe and arguably around the world. It's, it's been quite interesting. That it's, it's, it's ephemeral and hard to, to pin down, but clearly there is a, some kind of global mood of unrest collected to Tahrir Square. And, uh, you know, then you saw in, in you know, Madrid that the people who occupied the square there actually perhaps rather pretentiously but claiming the mantle of Tahrir Square saying we're doing this here. And then you had unrest in, in my own country, now in Russia. You have a palpable nervousness in China. You had problems in countries as diverse as Chile and Israel. Um, and one of the things that interests me is that I... That, that in different ways both democratic and authoritarian governments are struggling to cope uh, with this. So that in Europe you've had a kind of admission of failure by the governments of, of Greece and Italy where they had to bring in technocratic uh, leaders who are unelected to try to sort out the economies because uh, it was felt that the Berlusconi and the, um, the, the Greek governments were, were not doing the, the job. And that clearly has slightly worrying implications for those who, who hope that elected governments are, are capable of sorting out the economies. Um, and there's also the question of what happens if the technocrats fail. If, if we then move back to a sort of, you know, the next election in Greece and Italy, and if, if, if Monti and Papademos have not been able to produce the changes, where do people turn to then? So there's clearly uh, problems in, in the functioning of, of elected democracies in Europe, and yet... I don't think you're seeing what you might see under other circumstances, a kind of swing to people saying, well, perhaps the authoritarian way, the Chinese way, that's the way to do it, because they're not coping very well either. People are out on the streets of Russia. You've had, a, a, you know, obviously the Arab Spring sweeping away authoritarian governments in North Africa. So the, there's a, a crisis of confidence in democracies in Western Europe, but simultaneously you could argue that we might be at the beginning of another wave of democratization, beginning in North Africa, and who knows where it spreads next. Nouriel uh, and uh, 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 Bob, uh, what about the implications for economic policy here with the pressure uh, from the street, if you like, in the way that we've just described? Nouriel Rabini. <clears throat> well, the other speaker spoke about uh, new power and new leadership coming, say, from social media. But there is also a crisis in traditional power and leadership, both at the national level, international level. Take the Eurozone. You have 17 countries, 17 governments, 17 coalitions. They cannot agree even within their own coalition, within their own countries, let alone coordinate the necessary action to be taken at the international level. Now, what happened is, in the last decade, the G7 became obsolete, the club of the industrial countries, because we realized that to resolve global economic, financial, fiscal issues, you need to have also the systemically important uh, emerging market at the table. Now we have G20, that is the body of international policy governance, where you have half of them being emerging markets. But to me, as I pointed out in an article I wrote with Ian Bremer in Foreign Affairs last year, this doesn't look like a G20 world, it looks like a G0 world. Because on all these fundamental issues that require international coordination, they cannot be resolved at the national level, there is disagreement and there is no leadership. 
There is disagreement on monetary policy, whether you should ease or tighten, on fiscal policy, on exchange rates, on how to resolve global imbalances, on how to reform the system of regulation and supervision of banks and other financial institutions, how to change the international monetary system and the role of the U.S. dollar, on global climate change, on international trade, on energy security, on food security, let alone on the geopolitical issues in the world from the Middle East, Iran, Korea, and you name it. So live in a world in which you have the rise of many powers, the U.S. cannot impose anymore its own will, it used to be truly a G1 world, not a G7 world. You have other powers rising, and that's good, but on all these fundamental issues, we have massive disagreement. So it's a world in which actually there is a situation of chaos that can lead to conflicts like currency tensions leading to currency wars and eventually leading to trade wars. So that's the world we live in. It's a world of G0. So there is a, not only there is a pressure coming from social media and the power of that one, but traditional kind of power and leadership is fragmented and is divided and there is conflict across countries. I should um, just intervene and say, because Red Kennington, who's sitting in the audience, a good panelist, you're doing well at the moment, but where are the women panelists, uh, the Occupy panelists? I can't answer that. We have a panel which was preordained by others elsewhere, so take that up with other people, but I hear your point. Um, Bob, uh, just picking up again on power uh, and the impact on economic policy. Well, I, we're talking about leadership here, and it sounds like a, a lot... <laughs> A great goal, a great thing, but what is it? And I'm trying to think in terms of uh, uh, sociological theory. I'm thinking that um, Emil Bert Durkheim, 100 years ago, wrote about the collective memory, that we all remember the same things. Now I think it's collective memories. Now we have different internet communities. We're fragmented. But people surprise me. I meet people from a different community, and they don't seem to know basic facts that I know. So one thing is, another term that comes to my mind listening to you is uh, Galbraith, who wrote uh, in 1957 about conventional wisdom and about how pundits have an impulse when they get up on stages like this to repeat what everyone already knows. So, uh, and, and it reinforces a collective memory where we forget basic facts that might invigorate our thinking. So it seems like leaders have to be, how else can you be a leader? You have to be a scholar or a student of history and you have to have time and uh, that's what it's about. It's about leadership is a personality trait that some people have, which is to think about issues, to spend time understanding and then to just flout conventional wisdom and say it. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of is, is what a leader is. And then somehow in our society, Another uh, psychologist, uh, Stanley Milgram, referred to an instinct for hierarchy. We look, we have an instinct for, we're looking for that person uh, who is thinking independently. Unfortunately, most people who appear on stages like this don't have time to think independently. Well, one last comment about where we are now. I was just talking to someone running for the U.S. Congress, and she was, her experience was, you know, I don't have any time to think because I spend all my time raising money for the campaign. And she said, apparently in Congress, it's the same way. After you get there, you don't have time to think. You can't be a leader unless you have time to think and time to develop yourself as having an independent, well-informed judgment. Are there, does anyone want to come in on this issue of leadership, particularly if you're a woman? Please, microphone's around, otherwise I'll keep going. Um, can I have a little more light in here, actually? It's very difficult to see um, who is sitting there. But let me keep pushing this, because uh, Stephen Kehoe, for example, has tweeted, does Kishul Mababani believe China will allow a freer social media in the next five years? What would have to happen? But I'd like to keep asking all of you, how are leaders going to cope with this speed of the pressure from the street, whether it be the injunctions in Britain to stop footballers being named um, over alleged affairs, or whether it be the, the critical nature of politics and the pressure from, from, from the bottom up. Gideon, and please do disagree with each yeah, other. Yeah, well, can I just inject a note of scepticism? I mean, I think, obviously, what's happening with social media is incredibly interesting and so on. 
But we sometimes talk as if, you know, there was never a revolution in the past. You kind of wonder how they managed to storm the Bastille without, without Twitter. So, you know, <laughs> the, what, 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 what's happened, the, the social media are, are enabling people to connect in new ways. But, you know, there was a, a revolution in Egypt because people were unhappy with their economic... But wasn't it the speed? Yeah, but the point is that it, it, it manifests itself in a different way because of the speed of connection. But we've had revolutions for centuries, and they, and they happen for similar reasons, which is that people are unhappy with their economic and social circumstances. You know, tyrants are, wear out their welcome and so on. So the social media are a form of mobilizing and a form of expression. And I'll, I'll go a little further. Maybe they're a way... The, the, they make mobilization easier, so we'll be seeing more of it. But I think we should be wary of saying, we're in a totally new world. You know, we have had social and political upheaval for centuries. Kisho, and I have to press you. You come from a country where this is not a comfortable issue for the, for the leaders uh, in Singapore. Yeah. Can I, by the way, challenge the questioner who asks whether or not uh, China will allow more social media? Because that reflects the w conventional Western wisdom on China, which um, let, me, let me be extreme and say it's completely wrong. And why do I say it's completely wrong? Because there's this Western assumption that, is, that there are 1.2 billion uh, people in China who are being oppressed by a heavy, despotic Chinese Communist Party, and all they want to do is rise up and revolt and get rid of the Chinese Communist Party. Excuse me. The last 30 years of China's development have been the best 30 years that the Chinese people have enjoyed in almost 200 years. The improvement in standards of living and quality of life in China for almost a billion people has been unimaginable. And, be, and you, you may be surprised to learn that the majority of Chinese people are actually very happy with the trend of history that is happening inside China. Yes, they have problems, they have questions, they have challenges. But this idea that somehow or other all of the world is just rising up to revolt, I think doesn't understand that there are different streams of history happening. In the case of China, and certainly in the case of Singapore, since you mentioned Singapore, it's true that the ruling party lost votes. But excuse me, they still got 60%. And they won all the seats in parliament except six. So but they were surprised by the impact. They were, they were absolutely surprised. But the good news, I'm actually very glad that the ruling party in Singapore, not just surprised, I'm glad that the ruling party in Singapore got a shock because that shock was a useful wake-up call and it's how you respond to that wake-up call. And believe me, all over the region in Asia, people are talking about this and they realize they have to adapt. By the same time, I, I must emphasize one very important point to a Western audience, okay? Within the Asian cultural fabric, and I'm making a big point here, there is an awareness that the role of government is important. People are not trying to overthrow governments, they're trying to improve governments. And that desire to have a stronger, better government is part of the Asian cultural psyche. People would disagree with me, but I'm telling you that's how it works. Please disagree. Tom. What's the question? I'm sorry. Well, about how, mm. how profound this is going to be and how, how significantly or not uh, the leadership class will respond in the next few weeks, months. We'll, we're seeing this in Russia at the moment. We're seeing it elsewhere uh, as well. We may see it in France. We may see it in other parts of Africa. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, just to pick up on, on some things that um, uh, all the other panelists have said, you know, at the end of the day, bang, bang beats tweet, tweet. Um, look at Syria. Um, uh, look at Egypt. Um, uh, there are still all the traditional indices of power, and having just come from Egypt, one of them is simple rules of economics, like how much foreign reserves you have in the bank. Um, and right now, um, the entire Egyptian uh, uh, uprising is imperiled uh, by the, uh, the fact that the, the government is going to run out of money, number one, um, and, and number two, by... Um, some much longer term uh, laws of gravity. Um, you have in Egypt today the most dangerous um, uh, cohort in the world, the educated unemployed who aren't really educated. Um, not because of any problem on their part, it's that they have not been exposed and given the chance to really get the kind of quality education and the tools one needs to thrive in modernity. And, and so I think 
you know, after maybe the flush of this year and the, um, uh, of all the uprisings, may, maybe, uh, make no predictions, um, but maybe what this year is going to be about is the traditional laws of gravity asserting themselves on all of these movements. On the economic front, uh, Bob and uh, Nouriel, do you believe the traditional laws of gravity are going to apply? Uh, by, the, by the traditional laws of gravity, you mean coming back to the usual... I'm picking up what Thomas said. Yeah. Uh, okay, the, the question is, will, we be, will there be... An, this seems to be taking me off topic here. I'm not understanding what you're asking. Well, uh, what Tom has said, what Tom has said is that with the traditional laws of gravity are going to apply once we've been through the unrest created by social media or the, or, or the, or, or the new pressures. And I'm coming back to you as an economist and asking, are the traditional laws of gravity going to apply uh, in the economic field as well? As I'm asking you uh, to predict what's going to happen in the next year. Um, if I could start, you know, on that point, I, I think yes, because... Um, Social media and protest and inequality led to these revolutions in the Middle East, and that's good, and they want democracy. But there's not just a demand for democratic rights, but there's also a demand for having jobs and higher income and welfare and whatever. But the reality of the laws of economics is that it takes decades in which you invest in human capital, in physical capital, in infrastructure, you save more so that the economic pie grows higher, and therefore everybody can have higher per capita income. One of the things happening throughout the Middle East right now is that the pie is small, everybody says I want a bigger piece of it, so the public employees are striking and they want higher wages, the every private employee goes on a strike wants higher wages, wages are higher, public spending is higher, you finance it by printing money, eventually you're going to have a currency crisis, eventually you're going to have an inflation crisis, eventually you're going to have a sovereign debt crisis. The point is that the demand is not just demand for political rights. Everybody through the internet can see how we live, and they want to live the same way, but we know that the economic laws of gravity imply it takes decades of investing in the future, like it happened in East Asia, where there was savings, there was investment, education, public role of the government, until you had a bigger pie. And I think that even in the success stories, take the transition of Eastern Europe, it took a decade of social, political turmoil, crisis, debt, currency, financial, until they got stabilized. Right now, because of the pressure of social media, everybody wants a job, everybody wants a higher income in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya, in Yemen, in Syria, and so on. And there'll be a delusion because one thing is to change the regime, one thing to have democracy, and the day after, there are still no jobs, there are still no opportunities, and there's a gap between what people want now and it takes 10, 20 years of achieving it. And that's going to be a source of social and political instability that's going to negatively affect economic growth. So that's the thing we have to face. You know, just if yeah. I can pick up, just to reinforce Nouriel's point, so I was in Egypt for the last day of voting. Um, and in the last round of, in the round of parliamentary elections, I went to the poorest neighborhood in Cairo, a uh, all-women voting station. They've, they've segregated voting stations in some of these neighborhoods and interviewed um, uh, women who had just voted. All of them were covered. Um, uh, Ninety-nine uh, percent of them, we interviewed dozens, uh, voted either for Muslim Brotherhood or Salafists. Uh, then we asked why. Um, uh, jobs. We're, they're going to deliver jobs, they're going to deliver better roads, they're going to deliver better schools, they're going to deliver better security. Had I closed my eyes, and this was a focus group, um, you know, I, I never would have known I were speaking to people with a, with a religious uh, background. And I think uh, what Nouriel said, this mismatch um, between what it will take um, and, uh, and, and where they are starting from, I, I think is going to be a lot of what the story is about this year. All right, there's frustration already being aired on the tweets that you're not predicting enough. So I'm going to press you on predicting. Bob. Y your question took me aback because we were transitioning from deep questions about communication in society to the outlook, the economic outlook. And there's a tendency for us to view those as completely separate things. At least if you talk to professional forecasters who have their computer models, they won't talk about the issues. But so what you're prompting me to do is consider these together. And the irony about the current economic situation is that a good part of the cause of it is really sociological. And this is something that I firmly believe. And economists don't confront that often enough. So, can, so I a lack of you, can I persuade you to predict then what that means for the coming year? <laughs> uh, it's, okay, it's not just that. Any pre the, problem, the reason Nouriel is so good at that is he takes account of a whole host of things. And it's difficult to do that properly. 
is not just based on sociology, it's based on European balance sheets as well. But if you ask for my prediction, uh, I think that the Eurozone is going to be in recession this year. It's going to be worse than the minus 0.5 percent that the IMF predicts. The U.S. may not, the world may not. Uh, it's not going to be a great year, though. Nouriel, uh, can you outdoom that prediction? <laughs> well, on, on, pre on prediction and forecast, uh, Yogi Berra used to say it's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future. So. And there's you've, even, you've, it, made a, there's you, a, you've made a business yeah. out of it. <laughs> and, uh, and the other joke is uh, that God created uh, economists to make astronomers and weathermen look good in terms of predicting <laughs> the future as well. So uh, subject to those two caveats, uh, I would say some of the complexity in making prediction right now has to do with uh, economic and financial complexity, first of all. Secondly, that uh, social and political factors matter, and there's a complex interaction between macroeconomic developments, market reaction, endogenous policy responses, and how it fits to the real economy and the markets. So we live in this very complex world, and certainly because of uh, news being so much faster, the internet, social media, and also trading being much faster, the interactions and the complexity becomes much more difficult to make. If I had to make predictions, I would say uh, the biggest one is that, in my view, the Eurozone is a slow-motion train wreck. Uh, not only Greece, but other countries are insolvent and will have to restructure cursory their public debts, probably private debts as well. And two, that probably not all of the members of the Eurozone are going to be able to stay in the Eurozone, but at least a couple of them, and I would say first Greece, maybe Portugal, are going to exit from the Eurozone. If a cap, if a, uh, I would say Greece in the next 12 months. Uh, Portugal might take longer. But uh, if a couple of the smaller countries exit, the Eurozone survives. If it gets to the point in which the disorder affects Italy and Spain in terms of that restructuring or eventually exit in the next three years or so, you'll have a breakup of the Eurozone. And when you make predictions, you have to assign also probabilities because they're all the scenarios. And I would say there is, in my view, at least a 50% probability that over the next three to five years, not the next two mo 12 months, the Eurozone might actually break up. Let's tell the Eurozone, Gideon. Yeah, I mean, I think that, as everybody says, that the, the interaction between the economics and the politics is where the kind of action lies in Europe. I think that on the political side, we'll see a couple of things happening. Firstly, I think you will see a radicalization of politics in a number of European countries. I, I mean, I think one of the striking things so far is that that hasn't happened that much. So that you see in Spain, even though they're under enormous economic pressure, they move from a centre-left to a centre-right government. Same in Ireland. But if you look at opinion polls now in a lot of the countries that are under pressure, and actually even in the creditor countries, the countries that are writing the checks, you see new radical forces coming up. I was just in, in the Netherlands earlier this week, and the far left and the far right, the predictions for the next parliament is that they will get over a third of the seats. And we're talking kind of Marxists and, you know, the, 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 the Freedom Party, which is anti-Islam, anti-immigration. Um, in fact, the Socialist Party, which is the equivalent of what we're calling in Britain the Socialist Workers, are now top of the polls in the Netherlands. Um, and in Greece, you have, again, far left and far right with about a third of the, the vote. So I think if we have a continuing economic near chaos in these countries, it's very difficult to believe that's not going to find political expression uh, in elections and otherwise. And I think the other, the other trend to look at, I'll, I'll be brief, Nick, but is the potential for a backlash against the European Union, because if you talk to people in Brussels and in Berlin and so on, they say, well, the answer to all this is more Europe. And you're seeing that indeed in the front page of today's papers, a German demand for a commissioner to go into Greece and essentially run their budget, makes their tax and spending decisions. I think that's explosive. I think once you get to that kind of encroachment on national sovereignty in Europe, the potential for uh, the unraveling, not just of the the euro, but of the kind of political structures that underpin the European Union, is really quite real. Will there be an expansion of the bailout fund? <laughs> Look, I don't understand how they get to these numbers anyway. They double count and so on. I mean, I think that there will be a small expansion probably in Europe, but it won't be enough. And then a lot of the action will be in the IMF. Can they, can they get uh, other parts of the world to chip in? Will they be willing to? Um, but I, you know, the, what we've seen so far is that they keep come saying, 
we've got this big bazooka, we've got this huge figure, the markets will be overwhelmed, and they're just not. And so then they have to come back with an even bigger figure, and uh, so they've never really had enough, enough credibility. Tom Friedman, um, the issue of the Eurozone, Geithner saying yesterday it's still a matter of anxiety in the United States. Uh, where do you see this going? Do you see a slow-motion tra- train wreck? I'm going to pass on that. I, I just don't know enough about the Eurozone to right, make Kishore. any predictions. Well, I'm glad that Nouriel spoke about the uh, slow-motion uh, train wreck because if the Eurozone can somehow just stumble through and the world economy doesn't come crashing down, then I can tell you from Asia's point of view, it will be another good year. China will grow by 8 to 9 percent, India will grow 7 to 8 percent, Indonesia will grow 5 to 6 percent, and the region as a whole, I can tell you the one big change that is happening as a result of what I call the Western financial crisis of the last three years is that more and more Asians beginning to realize that to get growth, they have to rely more and more on themselves and more and more on the region. So China is trying to stimulate uh, internal domestic demand. Within the region, I can guarantee you that if you measure the trade flows at the end of 2012, within Asia, they'll be higher than in 2011. And within the region, I think you'll continue to see uh, uh, the sort of positive movement forward as long as the global economy doesn't come crashing down, as long as you have a slow motion process rather than a rapid train wreck. But you're, you're, you're talking about resilience, even if there is um, what Christine Lagarde is warning of as a 1930s moment approaching, and also the global economy in the danger zone. Nouriel? Um, yeah, I, I agree with the IMF, and my outlook actually for this year is even more bearish. I think in the Eurozone, you're going to have a very severe recession not just in the periphery, but the latest number from France and Germany, fourth quarter, suggests a recession. Outside of the Eurozone, the UK is in a recession. Uh, The US economic growth is anemic, subpar below trend. If you look at even the headline yesterday of fourth quarter growth, they said it's 2.8%, good news. Two out of that 2.8 was an inventory change. Final demand actually was growing 0.8. That means in the first quarter of this year, we might have close to negative economic growth. So even the US is not doing great. Uh, Emerging markets in Asia are doing fine, but I was recently in India, significant slowdown of growth, and they worry about it. And even in China right now, exports are slowing down because of the Eurozone problem. Uh, Real estate, commercial, residential, is slowing down sharply and deflating. And even infrastructure spending was boosting growth, now is slowing down because the railway ministry is bankrupt, the provincial governments don't have any more the revenue from land sales, and many of these <clears throat> SPVs that finance the infrastructure progress, projects are also bankrupt. So there will be a significant slowdown of growth of China. Now, this year we muddled through, maybe, because we are kicking the can down the road. We are kicking the can down the road in the Eurozone, where we are not making the tough choices of saying a few countries are insolvent, let's restructure their debts. Some countries cannot belong to the Eurozone, they should exit. We are kicking the can down the road in the United States, where there is zero progress on our fiscal deficit, Democrats vetoing spending cuts, entitlement reform, Republicans vetoing tax increases, eventually it's going to be a payback, especially next year when you have to face tough fiscal choices. And even China, because of their own political transition, they have to choose the new premier and the new president at the end of the year is kicking the can down the road. The model of growth of China, as their own premier said, is unsustainable, is unbalanced, and it cannot continue this way. It's unequitable as well. Too much exports, too much fixed investment, too much savings, not enough consumption. And they keep on saying, let's raise consumption and share of GDP. For the last 20 years, not gone up, it's gone down. And eventually, even China could have a hard landing. So maybe Modeled through in 2012, but 2013 could be a perfect storm where you have a full Eurozone crisis, where the fiscal problems of the U.S. come to a head, and where China keep on kicking the can down the road, cannot do it any longer when there is an investment bust and you have a hard landing in China as well. Can so I just check? Do you happen. have any positive predictions? <laughs> Well, the positive predictions, in my view, are about the long run. You know, Keynes was saying, in the long run, we're dead. But the reality is that we could be dead in the short run, because the Eurozone crisis, the US problem, the Chinese could lead to another global financial crisis and recession. In the long run, there are good news. Emerging markets is a long run story of higher growth and so on. Uh, Technology 
you know, whether it's ET and energy technologies or BT, biotech or IT, there's a huge amount of stuff is happening. The balance sheets and the PL of high grade corporates are strong. In the long run, globalization and international trade is going to be beneficial. There is so much new innovation coming from social media, Web 2.0, 3.0 artificial intelligence, uh, you know, cloud computing. Lots of good stuff could occur in the long run. The problem, we might not be alive in the short run. We might be dead if we don't resolve this financial problem. The long run looks brighter, but we have to get there. What about the, let's pick up on what Nuri has just said about the potential now for a hard landing in China. Tom, do you want to come in on this? Well, you know, again, I, who, who knows? I, I, I'm not going to make any predictions about that. Um, but you're here to make predictions. Yeah, well, then, <laughs> then I'm in the wrong place. You signed um, up. <laughs> actually, they made me come. Um, uh, you know, just what, what, what strikes me in listening to, to uh, what Neuro said and others is that, you know, if, if, if the world were a table with four legs, uh, the American economy, the European Union, the Arab world, and China, India, what strikes me right now, Nick, is that all four legs are really shaking, and they've never been more interconnected and interdependent. And um, so, you know, I, I can't speak to China. All, all I can speak to is why I've been arguing it is so important that in such a world, America gets its act together and address its own fiscal imbalances because if there's every time we needed a stable American economy, it's now. And uh, there is one thing I will predict between now and our elections. That's very, very unlikely to happen, absent a a crushing global crisis that basically forces us to address this. And so what I fear is we'll be back here a year from now. Um, we will have done nothing, and the hole will be that much deeper. Uh, Gideon, the, the, issue, the potential... Wait, 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 wait a minute. Let me just ask Gideon right. first, because I'm going to come back to you with another question, Kishore. Um, Gideon, this issue of a potential hard landing in China. Well, uh, like Tom, I'm, I'm cautious about saying anything definitive about that. I mean, cl clearly, if you go to... China, you can see with your, with your own eyes, even in booming cities like uh, like a Shanghai or Beijing, that there appears to be, you know, we've had good reports in the FT about huge empty apartment blocks, about shopping centres uh, that, that don't appear to have any customers. So there's there's been a building boom, and that will work itself out. But I think if you are growing at uh, eight to nine percent a year, there's, it's a slightly more forgiving environment in which to have a. Uh, um, financial problems because you can kind of absorb them amidst the general kind of growth. Whereas if you're in, in an environment like the, the UK or uh, the EU, deleveraging is much more painful because the, the trend growth is slower. So I'll just say that it's easy to, to point to instabilities in China and they're clearly there, but I, I've become skeptical about these predictions of imminent disaster in China because I've been hearing them for so long. You know, I used to edit the Asia pages of The Economist in, in 95 to 97. We were always saying China was about to crash. You know, there were problems in the state-owned enterprises and so on. I think I have a, still have a book on my shelves called The Coming Chinese Bust, and it was written in 1992. So, um, you know... One doesn't want to be over sanguine. Obviously, there, there, there are difficulties in, in the Chinese economy, but I suspect you're not going to have a, a hard landing. Uh, Kishore, you, I know you want to intervene, but I've got a, a tweet here from Peter Goodman. Uh, if uh, Mabubani honestly believes the Chinese adore the CCP, he needs to get out more. Democracy, abstract, land rights, wages, corruption. In other words, you're far too rosy about China. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me. this is a fact. Okay, you can all check this fact. Use your Google, use whatever instruments you want to use. Go back in January 2009, at a time when the world economy was supposed to go over the cliff. Read what every Western economist said would be the China's growth in 2009. The figures range from minus 20%, minus 10%, maybe 1%. And in that year, China grew by 9 or 10 percent. India also grew by 8 to 9 percent. So be careful of what I call conventional Western wisdom. Now, on China, I, by, the, by the way, let me just uh, emphasize for the record, I'm not a defender of the Chinese Communist Party, but I would like people to get in touch with the social and political realities of China, however comfortable or uncomfortable they may be. If you have a country of 1.3 billion people and you don't have a few thousand protests daily, it's not normal. They've had protests daily all the time. 
It's about how you manage and handle crisis all the time. And the one thing that the Chinese Communist Party has done, which is quite remarkable, is that it has transformed itself. It is today probably one of the most meritocratic political parties in the world. And the quality of economic management, and I've observed this going to Beijing over the last 20 years, the quality of mind of the professionals who are managing the economy has grown by leaps and bounds. They are aware of every negative prediction that comes China's way. And everybody who, by the way, says that China's about to crash is doing China a big favor because they then, they then sit down and analyze it thoroughly to say, he must know something we don't know. Let's study his prediction. And guess what? In the course of studying it, they then realize this is how we react. We've got 50 minutes to run. Let's move on to some other things. Iran. Tom, uh, the assessment at the moment, we know that the IAA has uh, said that they're up to 20% enrichment. Um, there appears to be a narrowing window, particularly with the movement of the centrifuges into the mountain near Qom. What's your assessment of uh, the Israeli options, the American options, the European options, and where this could go? Because the critical window is within the next 12 months. Well, there's no question that Israel is keeping its options open. Um, uh, they, they've, uh, they've made that very, very clear. And there's no question that the United States has made clear to Israel uh, that it does not want to see uh, Israel attacking Iran right now, um, at, not only at this fragile moment in the global economy, uh, but also because the consequences could be so unpredictable and the deepest, deepest American fear is that Israel would start a war with Iran that America would be forced to finish. And um, uh, so all, all I can point to, Nick, are these two hugely countervailing uh, impulses out there right now. They're, they're, you, you read what Barack and uh, Netanyahu have said. They see themselves as responsible for the fate and future of the Jewish people, nothing less than that, as they've described it, um, and that um, they're going to have to make, they, they argue, a decision about Iran because they believe Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon is an existential threat. I don't think that assessment is entirely shared by the United States, but whether it is or not, in the next 12 months, America, I think, has made it very clear they don't want Israel to do something that will start something they will be forced to finish. Do you think Iran's intentions are clear? Do they want to weaponize or get to the threshold and stop? Um, I think one can only go, uh, Nick, by, by what they've done so far, and that is... Uh, to you know, put themselves on the threshold, um, one screwdriver away, but uh, always be in a position of being able to um, plausibly argue that they uh, don't have a weapon and therefore not expose themselves um, to, to some kind of retaliation. Gideon, the political options for traction, for leverage against Iran, we're seeing what the EU is moving towards, but Iran is saying back, saying back, if you do that, we'll cut oil supplies. Yeah, I mean, there, there is clearly, there's a lot going on. There's a ramping up of sanctions. There's also clearly a very active covert war with, uh, you know, Iranian nuclear scientists being assassinated, strange computer accidents and so on. Uh, I would say, you know, this is a debate that people who've come to Davos, they, they have every year, you know, Israel, is Israel about to attack and so on. Yeah, but it's more pressing uh, No, now. I agree. I, I was about to say, I think this year it feels much more pressing. And you talk to some of the, the people who will end up having to make these decisions. And I was struck that they're, you know, it, it's, almost, it's slightly alarming how, how seriously they're taking the prospect of potential conflict with Iran. And Tom was very interesting about the U.S. One of the things that struck me about this crisis, say, compared with the Iraq one, is that the Europeans seem, to my mind, strikingly relaxed, more relaxed than I would imagine, about the prospect of a conflict with Iran. The French are pretty gung-ho. The British, similarly, are talking about it as a, as a possibility. I mean, it's not like they're pressing for war, but they're certainly it's within the bounds of possibility that we'll end up with in conflict. They're thinking about it in those terms. Does anyone want to come in on Iran with any further insight at all? Please, right at the back. Again, we're looking for predictions. Yeah, uh, my only comment is that um, in the 20th century, we had uh, preemptive behavior. So the Soviet Union decided that uh, uh, Eastern Europe is a threat, and so they invaded. Uh, Similarly, America went into, let's say, Vietnam 
and um, ultimately nobody in America today would argue that that was a smart thing to do. Um, so I would have thought that we now have global institutions in terms of the United Nations, whatever we, we may think about the UN um, Security Council and their ability to act, should not the UN Security Council uh, weigh in this situation uh, on both the players? All right, good. Um, on the, can, can you come in at all with any contribution, uh, Bob or Nouria, on the economic impact if there were to be if this were to go into a conflict. Nick, can I say one thing in response Please tell to that me question, which is you know, what strikes me about this moment, is that the party that actually has the most ability to um, influence Iran right now, uh, of course, is China. Um, huge customer for Iranian oil and gas. And if the Chinese actually went to Tehran and said, um, you know, we, we want you to uh, you know, put your program under uh, you know, total UN supervision and, and fulfill these obligations reassured the world, that's the only chance it could happen. Now what's ironic, and I don't think the Chinese have fully woken up to, small news story that happened, came out last week in the States, America became a net exporter of oil last week. And I don't, you know, there, there's a real shift happening here. We're out of Iraq, we've become a net exporter of oil, and with all the gas and the fracking issues coming up. The Chinese are more and more dependent on Iran, but they're still in that kind of mode of, you know, we don't do diplomacy. Um, and I think they're going to have to wake up to this one. No, yeah. Um, I cannot predict whether Israel or U.S. is going to attack Iran, but on the economic implication, I would say most likely oil prices will spike at least 50% uh, and you're going to have a global recession. Let's not forget that for the last 30 years, most of global recession has been associated with a spike in price of oil that was due to a geopolitical shock in the Middle East. You know, the Israeli Arab war, Yom Kippur of 73, led to an oil embargo, tripling of oil prices, global recession in 74, 79, 74, 75. The Iranian revolution in 79 led again to cut in the supply of oil and led to the global recession of 80, 81. Even the 1990, 91 recession we saw in the United States and globally was driven by the fact that oil prices spiked after the Iraq invasion of Kuwait in August of 1990. And even in the last recession, and let's not forget, in addition to Lehman and the mortgage crisis, by July of 2008, oil prices, not because of geopolitical risk, but because of speculation and other factors, reached $148 per barrel. And the reason why we had the global recession was not just the collapse of Lehman and the contagious effects of it, but once oil was $148 per barrel, that was a negative shock on the income of US, of Europe, of Japan, of China, of India, and of any other advanced or emerging market that was a net oil and energy importer, and it was one of the tipping points of the global economy. So. If we decide that we need to attack Iran, let's think about the consequence. And the consequence is going to be a guaranteed global recession and a very severe one at the time there are economic and financial fragility coming from the fact that the exit from the previous recession has been actually quite uh, shaky and uncertain. Kishore. Now let me again try to give the Asian perspective. I think a nuclear Iran will be a disaster for the world. It will create a trigger new arms race, and the world should work together, and I agree the UN Security Council should be involved in trying to prevent a nuclear Iran. So what's the best way of doing it? And here, if I one of, surprisingly, nobody has discussed it much in Davos. Huh? One of the most amazing things that happened in the year 2011 is that for, to everybody's surprise, Myanmar, this closed military regime, suddenly opened up. <laughs> And Hillary Clinton went to Yangon. So miracles happen. Now, why, why, did that young, why did that Myanmar miracle happen? It was because of 20 years of steady engagement by the ASEAN countries with a drip, drip, drip process of transforming the thinking in Myanmar. So I suggest that that drip, drip, drip process can work on Iran. And if you can think the unthinkable, okay, and if we all agree, I think we all agree that a nuclear Iran is unacceptable, why not do something completely out of the box and have the Chinese foreign minister and the U.S. Secretary of State fly together to Tehran and say, we've come here with a common message for you. Believe me, something as simple, as dramatic as that would be a huge wake-up call. 
And then you can build on the efforts that Turkey and Brazil and all did in the Security Council. So there, is, there are other options available. Tom and Gideon, do you think that's realistic, that, that kind of bilateral approach from t two major members of the Security Council? Well, you know, it's certainly, a, I think, a very legitimate idea. We, we, we need that kind of joint diplomacy at one level or, or another. I mean, it does seem to me, uh, I'd be interested in Nouriel's view on this, that the sanctions are biting. I mean, we've, we've got Iran's attention here, you know. Yeah, and that can have a... To, the thing is, the sanctions' effects are unpredictable. It's clear that they are, and their political effects are unpredictable. It could cause Iran to radicalize its behavior. I mean, you can see the way in which they're now saying, okay, we're not going to export oil to, to, to Europe. They could up the stakes themselves. We're running short of time, but it brings us on to Syria, particularly the role of Russia, uh, particularly with the Security Council uh, uh, reviewing it again uh, this week after the Arab League report. Again, what's your feeling about what's going to happen in Syria and what will happen to Assad? Tom? Well, yeah, I think the thing to keep in mind about Syria is this. My rule of the Arab Spring is, is the following. Um, uh, Egypt implodes, Libya implodes, Tunisia implodes, Yemen implodes, Bahrain implodes, Syria explodes. We have not begun to see the full geopolitical impact of the Arab Spring until Syria explodes and you take out what is basically the geostrategic keystone of the whole Levant region. Because what is really different about Syria is that it's a big Lebanon in the sense that um, uh, you have all the countries around Syria with fundamental interest in who rules in Damascus. The Israelis care about who's going to control the Palestinians there. The Turks are obsessed with who controls the Kurds there. The uh, Iraqis will be obsessed on the fate of the Shiites there. Uh, and the Iraqi Sunnis obviously will be very, very interested in the rise of the Sunnis there. Um, all the states around the, of Syria have enormous stakes in who rules inside. Therefore, the people inside will look to join with them to create leverage for themselves. And there is the prospect, if Assad does not leave tomorrow, of a full-scale civil war inside Syria. And when that happens, you will see an explosion, not an implosion. Can we make a prediction, do you think, or not? Can we make a prediction? On Syria. Can there be a prediction? Uh, yeah. Uh, all I would say is that, um, that I, I think what has been striking up to now about the Arab Spring is the absence of really, you know, geo it, it has not in any way fundamentally changed the geostrategic map, the interstate relations in the region yet. Uh, I think if the lid blows off in Syria, um, my prediction is that you will see um, some, some uh, real interstate tensions. Quickly, Nouriel and Gideon as well yeah. on Syria. Um, I would say, you know, the issue goes well beyond Syria in the following sense. The Arab Spring starts in Tunisia, then Egypt, then Libya, Syria, Yemen. Uh, there is still turmoil in Bahrain. There is a large uh, minority in Kuwait that could lead to turmoil. Uh, in uh, the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, there are tensions. Now that we left Iraq, the three sides are starting to kill each other. The tension between Turkey and Syria, Turkey and Iran, Turkey and Israel, Turkey and Cyprus the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and the risk of a military confrontation between Israel and U.S. and Iran. So there are lots of things that can happen in the Middle East that are going to lead to actually tensions that could spike all prices, even short of an outright military confrontation. Mm -hmm. Iran could react to these tensions by sinking four ships in the Straits and blocking the tankers. That's a potential reaction. Let's not forget, in the summer of 2006, there was a mild war between Israel and Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, and there was, had no effect on the supply of oil. There was worries that maybe it's going to involve Iran, Syria, and you name it. And all prices, in a matter of weeks, went from $60 per barrel to $80 per barrel. This was during the Israel-Lebanon war, and it was a minor one. Right. Think what would happen if these tensions in the Middle East are going to rise throughout the Middle East. All price already $100 per barrel. is starting to bite negatively on growth. Okay. It's leading to instability from Nigeria <clears throat> to other countries. That's the risk we're facing. Again, but on Syria particularly, yeah, particularly well, the let, Russian let, role. Let me attempt a prediction, albeit with a health warning, but if I had to guess what's going to happen, I suspect we're going to end up with international intervention of some sort in Syria if Assad does not What burn. kind? Well, that's a big question. I mean, there's deep reluctance to do another Libya. You know, you talk to the Western powers that are involved, they say that that's a one-off. You know, Syria is a much more difficult case, so they don't want to get dragged in, but... I think if it goes on and there's a real humanitarian disaster, then 
there will be pressure on the West, but they will try and palm it off and hope that the Arab League, which is suddenly making much more interventionist noises than they have done in the past, might start to, to doing, doing something. It will probably start with things like safe havens for refugees. The Turks might be involved in that sort of thing. But the idea that this can just continue being slugged out within Syria without the rest of the world getting involved, if the humanitarian toll mounts, I suspect it's going to come under enormous pressure. Time is up, but I'm going to keep uh, just asking for predictions on two or three more things. First of all, the U.S. election, uh, particularly after what happened uh, with, between uh, Gingrich and Romney last, last week. There's an interesting tweet here. Will a Republican president, uh, with a Republican president, the USA will attack Iran? One more reason not to let this happen. But first of all, what's going to happen in the U.S. election? Tom. Well, you know, if you, if you force me to predict, um, I would simply make one prediction. The, you know, whoever wins this election will not, will, will not have a mandate to do what needs doing. And who will um, win the election? I have no idea. Yeah. Get in. Uh, I think it's looking much better for Obama than it did about a month ago. Uh, particularly if it's Gingrich he was running against. Well, I, I, I think, frankly, from the, from the point of view of the rest of the world, we may be better off with Obama being re-elected because a second-term American president who's not running for re-election has a greater freer hand in fixing things. And I actually hope that Obama will be re-elected. Bob Schiller? Well, I think that it's really close. It, the, the irony of our elections, we, we do all this talk, but the outcome seems to be determined by the state of the economy if the economy is improving on election day, it'll be Obama. Right now, it's a toss-up. I, I just can't predict one no or the other. Um, it's not going to be a landslide either way. Uh, it's going to be a toss-up. I think it's likely that Obama is going to win. But regardless of who's going to win, the problem is that the U.S. political gridlock is going to be the same as before. Because if Obama wins, he's not going to have 60 votes in the Senate and the Republicans can block everything. And if Romney or Gingrich wins, they're not going to have 60 votes in the Senate, and the Democrats can veto entitlement reforms or whatever else. So the gridlock here is to stay in the United States. France, Tom, the French election. I'm afraid I'm going to take another pass on that. <laughs> Kishore. Uh, pass. I'm definitely <laughs> off this okay, panel. Well, look, I, I'll, 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 <laughs> you're disqualifying yourself from this panel <laughs> next year, you guys. From your lips to yeah, yeah, it's 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 All right, <laughs> Bob, let me come to the other end. Do you have a prediction no, for I'm France? On that. <laughs> Nouriel. Well, my prediction for France is that regardless of whether it's Hollande or Sarkozy being elected, the risk is that France, that was supposed to be member of the core of the Eurozone, is going to end up in the periphery. We used to have the core or the hard core and the periphery. Mm. Right now there is a soft core of countries that actually may end up in the periphery. They're in purgatory, and France is one of them. Well, uh, actually, I mean, I, I was speaking to some genuine French people, and even they can't predict this. Genuine one. French people? Yeah, uh, you know. Uh, there, there's a, Are there uh, fake French people around? They're, 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 they're none of them up on the platform. But, uh, <laughs> but and, you know, they find it's, it's, it spits four ways, potentially, the first round, and a, lot, a huge amount will depend on whether uh, Marine Le Pen manages to get through to the second round. Then whoever runs against her wins. All right, I'm trying hard to get a prediction uh, from the panel. I won't come to you first, Tom. What about Russia? Gideon, you're about to go there. Yeah, well, I'll tell you when I've been. No, you tell me now. <laughs> what? Okay. Um... Particularly because, and this is where we're bringing the whole thing back to where we started, the pressure, the new pressures from an empowered sure. population. Well, you know, Bob Schiller mentioned conventional wisdom at the beginning, and I think the conventional wisdom at the moment is that Putin will somehow tough it out, and he will, we will end up with President Putin by, uh, by the end of the year. But, but a, I, lower, seems... a lower support for him? Well, clearly. But the question is, is it being counted properly? Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 a huge amount is going to turn on, let's say the, the election result is announced, it's Putin, he's back. Does that bring people out onto the streets in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg? And this time, do they stay there? I'm not going to ask anyone else unless you want to volunteer prediction. Uh, okay, um, we have to wind up. Has anything, anyone got any wonderfully positive prediction for this year? I thought I, thought, I, thought I began with a very positive prediction that uh, the world is going to get better and better by the end of 2012. We'll hold you to that in 2013. Um, can I say that well, there is one uh, tweet here, if the WEF pundits were at the Google party, they're doing very well. So even if you didn't... Uh, 
uh, maybe offer a prediction on certain things. Finally, let me just ask, I know I'm being asked to wind up, but Emily Kolewole, curious to know what is predicted for the millennials, the global shapers, the next generation in the coming year. Can you answer that in any way? What is predicted for the next generation? About the, should they be optimistic about the... They're going to get older. <laughs> <laughs> and I do apologize that we haven't heard many, if any, female voices in the last hour, but that's the way it has been this morning. Maybe my prediction for next year is this will all be women. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you.